to this edition of the Monday Majlis, and our guest is Olga, or rather Holly uh, Davidson, as everyone knows her. And I had, I was thinking a lot how to introduce her, so eventually I wrote it down, and this is it. So she is an ineffable, ineffable, pure source of force, an effervescent, shining fountain of support, a flamboyant walking literary saloon. And one could continue, but I don't want to continue myself. I would rather give Olga the word to talk about herself, what she really didn't want to, but I, I've been trying to convince to talk about, uh, to talk a bit about it herself. And then, then, then to to go as as uh, the sunnah of the majlis is to to her talk. Olga, please. Thank you all for attending. I will say a few things about myself. Is obviously I'm not Persian. Um, I'm a, a Bostonian, and uh, I was a classics major when I was an undergraduate. And uh, at Boston University, and then Boston University offered Arabic, classical Arabic and classical Persian, first through the classics department. And I was one of these people who I got really excited about having something expanding in classics. So I first started with Arabic because I wanted to do Persian, but my Persian, the per woman who's teaching Persian because I asked her if she could change the times because only two people for it because I wanted to do Thucydides which I did with somebody called Michael Fivash and we used to get very stoned <laughs> and try to figure out what was happening in the wars um that was how I did classics but um but she couldn't do it so I learned Arabic first and it was a toss-up whether I wanted to continue in Arabic or Persian and that summer I met my husband who's a classicist and a Hungarian and sort of the end of the summer, we're pretty obvious we're going to get married. So I thought, how boring to be in the same field. So it was a toss up between doing the Mu'alakat or the Shahnameh. And then I started learning Persian. And uh, now going back to the Shahnameh, there's another little excerpt in my life, which I saw when I was 19 years old, that the so-called Houghton Shahnameh or the Tahmura Shahnameh was being ex um, exhibited at the Corning Glass Museum because Arthur Houghton was from Corning, New York. And I had never seen more beautiful things in my life and very was very aware that this was a these were illustrations to an epic. I knew nothing about it, um, but I knew it was Indo-European. And so I sort of put in my head, must learn Persian. So these sort of things vary and stuff. But anyway, I ended up going into graduate school. I went to Princeton and my husband was teaching at Harvard. And this is what I'm telling young women who, if they suddenly find themselves in the family way and commuting and stuff like that, everything is possible. <laughs> so I was at Princeton expecting my son, uh, my first year in graduate school, and he was born um, in the middle of my second semester. And I remember Shafia Kaitkani getting very, very, very happy that I had a boy uh, because he started going on about Sohrab and because he was teaching at Princeton at the time. And I was dumb enough to think that babies slept, which they didn't. But anyway, I managed to get through. Princeton was quite nice, but I managed to get through that year. And then um, my husband was at the Institute of Advanced Studies. So I did another semester um, at Princeton. Princeton was kind of a great place to go to school because they didn't make you have to take classes forever. We just, we just, we had a, we had to have it. Um, you could actually get away with just doing one year of classes, but I did two year of classes. And then I took my generals immediately because I really wanted to be free. And so that's basically what I did. I kind of went through Princeton very, very quickly in a very single-minded way. Um, and uh, always hoping to go to Iran to learn how to speak Persian because I just could read it. And being a classicist was very good because it makes you very, very text oriented. And you read, and I also was heavily trained to read out of the text, not into the text. Um, and then when I was, uh, you know, when I suddenly was sort of there and sort of trying to figure out what to do, I was lucky in terms of getting strange jobs. Um, I was <laughs> given a job to teach Islamic mythology. Can you believe it? They called it that at Holy Cross. Then I had my Christian Judaic year when I was teaching both at Holy Cross as well as Brandeis University. And then I taught at Brandeis forever. 
and then left Brandeis, went to Wellesley, left Wellesley, went to BU, and now I'm, you know, semi-retired. I never cared about whether I had a tenure track position. I made as far as associate professor, but what mattered to me more than anything else in the world is publications. And I remember, and I also refused, I was um, to be in a commuting relationship. I did um, what one point was, you know, interviewed for Columbia, Michigan and Ohio State or whatever, but I was not serious. I just went to go meet people and <laughs> get, get an excuse to see what Michigan was like and Ohio because I hadn't been because I'm a really incredibly hopeless Northeasterner. Um, but anyway, that's basically my story. And I've had a lot of fun doing this. Um, now I'm going to actually read my text because what I want you to understand, there's a, I'm a real comparatist and I really like the Shahnameh, but I do come from it from a classics background. I was an Albert Lord student and I also uh, worked, didn't work directly with Jimmy Zeal, but he was a huge supporter of mine. And I was lucky having that. I wrote a, my undergraduate dissertation on Heracles' role in the Iliad. He doesn't have a role in the Iliad, by the way, it's just a metaphor. But anyway, that was what my illustration, my uh, undergraduate um, uh, thesis was about. And Jimmy Zeal uh, read it. And which was really nice to read somebody's undergraduate thesis. And then I had another thing which I wrote as an undergraduate with the, about something about the Dolinea. But it's very interesting in these sort of little bits and pieces of, you know, and really focusing on that little detail in, um, in uh, the Iliad. And um, when I was pretty young and had two children, I met Dumézil. And he and I showed him my dissertation, which I was working on. And he, this is what he said. He first he said you had to write to him to see if he's going to see you. Then he saw me, and then I hand gave him my dissertation, what I was doing. And then <laughs> this is what I really love. He called me back a week later, and then he wanted to relate to me as a young person. So he said, "Ça c'est très chouette, ça." <laughs> I just love the fact that he said that because it was funny. But anyway. That was my great moment in, in my youth of having somebody like that support me. And he did uh, put it in Mary Boyce's, the whole thing in Mary Boyce's fest trip through Duchenne Guimain. So I was kind of lucky very early in my um, age is to suddenly be catapulted into something as big as being in Mary Boyce's fest trip, all 80 pages of it, which caused some consternation and among her. But I'm not going to get into this. However, I am now going to tell you is that I don't know if you've read Best of the Achaean, not Best of the Achaeans, my husband's book, um, Poet and Hero, but I focus in on the big thing which I really care is reception and also the life story. And I started playing with this in, um, from the very beginning, just looking at the comparative life stories, but I never really looked at the bison gore. Now I've been looking at the bison gore and being really obsessive about the bison gore, which is sort of all over the place. And I wanted and now will do a um, translation and a commentary on it. And that the reason it'll get done and it will get done is because I'm partnering with Nagin Yavadi to do this. And we are going to have one hell of a good time doing this. So she just agreed to do this yesterday and it makes me really happy. Now with your, with your let me um, read my thing. I will put on my glasses so I look very intellectual. And then I'm going to start reading this. Um, and I have to be out of here at 1.30, so I'm gonna read this at somewhat of a fast clip, ish. Since 2001, I've been working on the ongoing project of translating and commenting on the so-called preface of the Bison Gordi recension of the Shahnameh Ferdosi, which had been commissioned in the year 1426 CE and published, that is made public in the year 1430 CE under the aegis of a Timur prince named Baisangor. While working on this project for well over two decades now, I'm nearing the point where I'm ready to prepare an online version of my translation. This is all thanks to Nagin and commentary based on a series of essays I've already published over the past two decades, both in print and online, about my ongoing research delving into both the preface and the actual text of the Baisangori recension of the Shahnameh Ferdosi. As I contemplate such an online publication of translations and comments, I found that all my existing essays about the Bison Gordi recension center on one single unifying fact about poetry of Ferdosi as reflected in the preface of the actual text of this recension. 
That fact is what I describe in my presentation as the ecumenism of Ferdowsi, which is connected to a second fact. And that fact is this. Ferdowsi's verses are contextualized in the preface of the to of tolerant of, in the preface as tolerant of West as well as East Persian epic traditions, also of Shiite as well as Sunni worldviews. By this second fact needs to be appreciated in the light of a third fact. And the third fact, which is a matter of history, is simply this. It is evident historically that the primary patron of Ferdowsi was decidedly partial to the Eastern epic traditions. And even more evidently, he was decidedly intolerant of Shia and other Sunni religious adherents. This patron was Mahmoud ibn Sebukin of Ghazna. Of Ghazni, Sultan and ruler of the Ghaznavid Empire from 998 to 1030 CE. In my presentation here, I offer an explanation in terms of the historical context of the commissioning of the Bayesangori recension, and I take into account recent theories about literary reception in the pre modern world. Let me briefly review three facts that I see in play before I begin my argumentation. The first fact, as I argue, is that the poetry of Ferdowsi, as published in the Bayesangori recension, dating from the 15th century CE, is ecumenical, as I call it. The second fact, as I argue, is that such ecumenism makes room for West Persian as well as an East Persian epic tradition. And third fact, which does not have to be argued because it is so well known to experts in Persian history, is that the context of the patronage of poetry of Ferdowsi, dating back to the life and times of the poet himself in the late 10th and early 11th century CE, was incompatible with the Western epic traditions and downright hostile to the Sunni world views. As I said at the beginning, I've dealt with all these facts, and as I see them in my printed and online publications over the last two decades. But I must add that I cannot here go into detail about all the aspects of my publications. This really gets boring too. Um, dealing with the ecumenism of Ferdowsi. For the sake of keeping with the limits of the time we have together and to make sure that listeners have an opportunity to ask questions or more likely to make comments, I delimit my presentation to focusing on ecumenism in, of Ferdowsi with regard to religion. As I hope to show, such ecumenism can be best can be understood in terms of the reception of the poet's poetry, a reception extended from the poet's own life and times in the 10th and 11th century CE, all by way of the era of the Timur prince Baisangur in the 15th century CE. And in order to unpack some key elements in my argumentations, I have to start by making general comments about the term reception and about various kinds of relevant reception, which I will describe in general terms within square quotes as the life of Ferdowsi. The term ecumenism, which is highlighted, can be linked with another term, globalism. Both terms are ordinarily used in the context of studying world literature, as it is understood today. And all three of these terms, including now world literature, are relevant to an assertion that we see being made in the text of the Baisangori preface about the newly edited version of the Shahnameh, which as I already noted was composed over 400 years earlier than the actual composition of the Shahnameh in the late 10th century, 10th and early 11th century BCE. Basically, the preface asserts that the poem is universal in its appeal. In terms of such an assertion, then this monumental poem could be described as world literature. But there is an impediment here, in that the world in which literature represented by the Shahnameh came to life was different from the world today. To put it slightly different way, the world literature of the Shahnameh was different from the world literature of today. In this statement, if this statement holds, then in terms I've highlighted so far will need to be adjusted in the context of my analyzing historical background that shaped the two texts under the study here. That is, both the poetic Shahnameh composed by Ferdowsi and the prosaic preface commissioned by Prince Baisangul. For such an analysis, I find it useful to highlight the importance of another term I'm using, reception, precisely in the context of analyzing the relevant historical background. The terms ecumenism 
and globalism are suited to the study of world literature as viewed in the world today, where the world literature ideally includes all of humanity, that, that is, everyone who have, inhabits planet Earth. Such idealism admittedly tends to be westernized as the work of William McNeil in the Rise of, um, Rise of the West, History of Human Community, for whom ecumeny of the world today arose from European interactions in realms of science and technology combined with political and economic know-how. By contrast, the world of Ferdowsi, as mediated in the edition and preface commissioned by Prince Meisselgord in 1426 CE, was an empire that included all of humanity inhabiting whatever realms were controlled, either for real or at least notionally by the dynasty of the Timurids, as represented in this case by Bisangur. In other words, this world of Ferdowsi was an imperial project. Having noted the rootedness of the terms ecumenism and globalism, the historical context of what I have so far been describing as imperial projects I'm now ready to adjust these terms before I apply them further to the historical realities surrounding the Shahnameh in the era of Timur Prince Baisangur. Basically, my adjustment amounts to this. The ecumenism and globalism of the poem asserted in the preface of, to the poem is limited in reality, if not in ideology. Although the preface to the poem asserts an idealized universal acceptance of the poem, such universalism is in reality limited to the historical confines of the empire ruled by the Timur dynasty at the time. The idea of universal acceptance asserted to the, um, in the Baisangur preface to the Shahnameh is relevant to the term reception used by literary critics. This term is nowadays generally applied to rereadings in the present of literature once read and the distance past. In terms of such general understanding, the rereadings in the present are neutral about valuing or devaluing the readings in the past. In the case of the Baisangori preface, however, the attitude is not neutral, but one-sidedly positively positive evaluating the Shahnameh as read in the present by contrast with negative as well as positive evaluations in the past. In the present time of the Baisangori preface, the text of the monumental poem that, is introduce, uh, that it introduces is supposedly perfect and thus worthy of universally positive evaluation. Don't mess with Baisangori. I adjust the term reception with reference to the Shahnameh as an introduction by the way of the Baisangori preface. In addition, adjustments must be noted here, as we will see in the stories told in the Baisangori preface, the reception of the Shahnameh can be viewed not only as the act of reading the poetry composed by Ferdowsi, but also as the act of listening to the performance of his compositions. Aside from the traditional reception of the Shahnameh as viewed from the standpoint of the Baisangori preface, I would argue that various kinds of modern reception can be just as favorable. I would also argue that the poetry of Ferdowsi can have a universal appeal even outside the historical context. So long as this poetry is translated effectively, as for example, the English language rendition of Dick Davis, the Shahnameh can become user-friendly for non-Iranians as well as Iranians. By the way, when I was teaching at Brandeis, I had to teach world literature. We had to teach the second semester, first semester we always had to teach Genesis and Exodus and the Iliad. And in the second semester, it always varied for whatever was considered world literature, either King Lear or Dante or something like that. But this is what I did. I would spend a week, maybe, a week and a half on King Lear and six weeks on the Shahnameh. So I had generations and generations of Brandeis students growing up with the fact that the Shahnameh is the most important poem in the entire world. I just want to say that. So now we'll go back to being serious. If the Shahnameh were, were to be owned exclusively by Iranians, there would always linger an assumption, implicit or even explicit, that this masterpiece of poetry cannot really be appreciated properly by non-Iranians. In translation, however, this poetry can be recognized by non-Iranians together with Iranians as a jewel of world literature. 
that truly rivals such Western classics as Virgil's Aeneid and the Homeric Iliad and Odyssey, to cite perhaps the most formidable points of comparison. I might also throw in Das Nibelungenlied, God, that's a great thing to compare to Shachname, as well as the Tainbul Kulain. The argument that I just presented about the value of reading of the Shach of Fedosi Shachname in translation can be extended, I argue, to a parallel reading, again in translation, of four surviving biographies of Ferdosi. I will hereafter do these four narratives as lives of Ferdosi. The four lives of Ferdosi focus on the grandest one. It is found embedded in the Baisangori preface. This preface is in its own right a grand introduction to a truly monumental book, the Baisangori Shahname. Do, do, do. The production of this book containing the Shahname of Ferdosi is the most expansive form around 58,000 couplets in length. I was commissioned by the Timurid prince, whom I've already mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. For over two decades by now, as I said at the beginning, I've been working on this long-term project. I'll skip that. In studying the narratives preserved at the lives of Ferdosi, especially with the Baisangori preface, I will focus here on one particular story that tells about the feelings of disappointment experienced by the poet Ferdosi in reaction to the indifference or even hostility of Sultan Mahmud of Ghazna, King of Kings, whom the poet hoped to have had, um, have as his primary patron, who as patron would have been expected to reward Ferdosi for producing poetry that glorified it, but glorified him. The poet's reaction to the negativity of the Sultan, according to this story, was to change the course and compose verses that now turned around and blamed Mahmud instead of praising him. These negative verses of blame are conventionally known as the satire. In the version of the life of Ferdosi as transmitted by the Baisangori preface, we read a retelling of this story in the, of the satire. Even more, the verses of the satire are extensively quoted in the Baisangori preface. This is what I really find interesting. I mean, I, okay, stop. Many experts who study the Shahname have a big problem with the retelling in the Baisangori preface of the story about the satire and even more so with the actual quoting, as it were, of verses from the satire. The problem can be restated by way of asking three questions. One, how could Ferdowsi and the Shahname praise the Sultan for his greatness and then go ahead and undo his praise? Two, if he did try to undo such praise, how in fact could it possibly get undone? And three, poet really intended to undo the praise that had been already lavished on the sultan in various passages of the Shahnameh by, by then turning around and blaming him in the satyr, why would the text of the Baisalguri preface, which introduces the Shahnameh that contains all those praise, all that praise of sultan, of the sultan by the poet, include in the same introduction, the blame it, that is intended to undo the praise? together with the framing story that justifies the, blank, the blame. All these questions are reactions of a, to a basic fact, which is this. The acts of praise from Mahmoud by Ferdowsi were originally embedded inside the text of the Shahnameh and could therefore not be readily extricated from the text. And then there's a second basic fact. The embedding of the praise was chronologically layered. That is to say, Ferdowsi praises Mahmoud at several different points within the length of the Shahnameh. And these points in time are regularly contextualized as referring to a particular phrase, phase in his own life. It's like saying, I, the poet, particularly phase in the, um, I, the, I, the poet, praise you, the Sultan, because you are great. And I praise you at this point in time when I am X years old and when Y things have happened to me. For an appreciation of these two facts, namely the embedding of the praise and the chronological layering of the praise, I recommend a thorough reading of a book by Shapur Shabazi, it was done in 1991. I'm really old, by the way, 1991, who conscientiously tracks all the self-references of Ferdowsi through the vast corpus of verses contained in the transmission of the Shahnameh through the ages. 
Although I disagree, as we are about to see, with the solution proposed by Shah Bazi himself in confronting the problem that I've just outlined, I must put on record my deep respect for his systematic approach in collecting all the details to be gleaned from the text of the Shahnameh itself about the life and times of Ferdowsi. For Shah Bazi is the only one, the only, the one and only reliable source we have for learning any details about the life of Ferdowsi is the actual text of the Shahnameh, which I will label here as source A. Before we consider the solution proposed by Shah Bazi, however, I ask this hypothetical question. What if Ferdowsi, in real life, simply changed his mind about the Sultan of Mahmud? I thought you're a great man, but no, you're not. So I will now blame you instead of praising you. Such a question, simplistic as it is, runs the risk of viewing the poet himself in a bad light. How could Ferdowsi praise Mahmud so lavishly and for so long in the course of his lengthy poetic career? Was the poet all that naive? Or was he perhaps insincere? I did not really mean it when I said whatever I was saying when I was praising you in my poetry, that you were oh so generous. But now, finally, after all these years, I can say that you were a mean-spirited twit. That's my paraphrasing. The very idea of entertaining such hypothetical questions about naivety or insincerity is understandably unappealing to experts who insist on defending the character for Dosi since through their own way of thinking, such questions undermine the moral integrity of the poet and even of the poetry. I have reached the point that I'm ready to consider the solution proposed by Shah Bazi. Defending poetic integrity of Ferdowsi, he argues, that, that the story about the satire is an invention and the satire itself is forgery in the sense that Ferdowsi himself could never have composed it. Shah Bazi goes on even further. He argues that Ferdowsi himself would never even went to the court of Mahmud and that he merely sent copies of his poetry to the Sultan. But then the question remains, why would such a story about the satire get to be retold? And why would the verses of the satire get to be requoted in the prestigious Baisanguri preface? which is the same time, which, is the, which at the same time introduces the text of the very same Shahnameh that proclaims its patron as the same king of kings who is defamed by the satire. I propose a different solution. Let me start, however, by making three concessions. First, I accept the idea that Ferdowsi of the satire is a Ferdowsi who is different from a Ferdowsi of the Shahnameh as we know it. Second, I also accept the idea that this different Ferdowsi would seem to be a false poet, not a true one, to some Iranians. And third, I'd even accept the idea that the verses of the satire would seem to be a forgery. But I should quickly add, the satire was seen to be a forgery only to some Iranians in the era of Prince Baisangur, especially to those who embraced the Sunni worldview, but not to other Iranians, especially to those whose worldview is Shia, not Sunni. In terms of my proposed solution to the problem confronting us today, as we read in the Baisangori preface, both the satire and the story that contextualizes the satire, what we see in this part of the preface is the life of Ferdowsi that contradicts other lives of the poet. I use here the word life, not in the everyday sense of real life, but in the literary sense of vita. That is the story of a life, a story that is myth. But I also use the word myth here, not in the everyday sense of a story that is not true, which is what Shabazi means when he says that the story about the satire is merely a myth. Rather, I use the word myth in the anthropological sense of narrative that con conveys by way of storytelling the truth values of, a, of the society in which the giving narrative has it, had evolved in the first place. Such an anthropological understanding of myth is in fact close to the original meaning of the ancient Greek word mythos, from which the modern word myth is borrowed. In a paper um, on the lives of Homer, you will see the Greg uh, Gregory Nash, that's my husband, we work a lot closely together, says that his aim is to show that the narratives of these lives are myths, not historical facts about Homer. In this context, he adds an important qualification. To say that we're dealing with myths, however, is not at all to say that there is no history 
to be learned from the lives. Even though the various homers of various lives are evidently mythical, mythical constructs, the actual construction of myths about Homer can be seen as historical fact. The claims made about Homer in the lives can be analyzed as evidence for the various different ways in which Homeric poetry was appropriated by various different cultural and political, political centers throughout the ancient Greek speaking world. The same can be said, then the, the same can be said here, as I argue, I'm now back, not, not quoting Greg anymore. The same could be here, um, as I argue, about the lives of Ferdowsi. Here too, the different claims that we read in different sources about the life of the poet can be analyzed as evidence for different historical contexts that shape the transmission of poetry attributed to the poet. A theoretical term that Naj and I both use in addressing the question of finding historical context for transmission of poetry is reception. And we argue further that there had existed two parallel media for the reception of both ancient Greek poetry and medieval Persian poetry. One medium, of course, was the text, which had to do with whatever was written to be read. But there is also the parallel medium of the oral tradition, which had to do with whatever was composed to be performed for listeners. Since I'm focusing on the Baisangori preface, which as we saw was an introduction to a vastly expanded version of the Shahnameh produced in 1430 CE, I need to focus also on what kind of reception that was in store for the poetry of Ferdowsi in that era. For the moment then, I must concentrate not on the life and times of the poet Ferdowsi himself who flourished in the late 10th and 11th century CE, but on the status of the poetry attributed to him in the era of the text of the Shahnameh as published by Prince Baisangur over 400 years later in 1430 CE. How this poetry received in 1430 and thereafter is what I need to highlight here. I've already elaborated on the ecumenism, as it were, of Prince Baisangur in producing an augmented form of the Shahnameh that spoke to the widest possible range of reception as would befit the empire of the Timur dynasty, which demonstrated its claim to imperial greatness by trying to outdo even the cultural as well as the political ambitions of Sultan Mahmud, who had once been so many years earlier, the ultimate patron of the Shahnameh. What I see then is a rivalry between Baisangur and Mahmud as patrons of the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi. I say it this way, even though the two of them are separated by hundreds of years. Baisangur is competing with Mahmud in promoting the Shahnameh. That is why I think the Baisangori preface can give you some credit, um, can give some credit to Mahmud as a potential supporter of Ferdowsi, but the ultimate credit must go to Baisangur for his full support. Moreover, the Baisangori preface makes Mahmud look bad occasionally, especially in the satire, but even this negativity about Mahmud is primarily, motive, is primarily motivated, I think, by a, co a correlative positiveness. Mahmud must be demeaned as a foil for the sake of elevating someone else who is supposedly a far better patron of poetry, and that ultimately, ultimately and that ultimate patron must be the princely figure of Baisangur himself. In my seventh of my early essay, earlier essays, I focused on a striking passage taken from the satire embedded in the Baisangori preface. That is the introduction to the Baisangori Shahnameh. I will end my presentation here by quoting my translation of that passage. But first I propose to provide here a detail about the reception of the Shahnameh before the era of Baisangur. In episode, tw episode 20 of the Chahar Maqala of Nezami, Aruzi, composed somewhat around 1155 to 1157 CE, we read that Ferdowsi, who was a dekan or a landowner in Tuz, spent 25 years composing the Shahnameh, hoping that the reward of his labors would, be, would provide dowry for his daughter, who is his only child. The governor of the city, whose name was Hoye um, Ibn Qutayba, treats fairly the landowner poet, not oppressing him with taxes. When the poet completes the Shahnameh, then and only then, so it seems in the terms of the narrative, the composition is transcribed by a scribe named Ali Dailam in seven volumes. 
Then, and only then, so it seems in terms of the narrative, the composition is performed by a reciter named Abu Dolaf. After that, together with Abu Dolaf, the reciter, Ferdowsi sets out for Ghazna, capital Sultan of Sultan Mahmud. There he finds a patron, a kitab, a, a katib, I'm sorry, a katib, scribe of the Sultan. This scribe named Ahmadi Hassan, Marmandi, presents the Shahnameh to Mahmud. Um, to Mahmud. Um, the Sultan accepts it and is grateful to Ahmadi Hassan. But Ahmadi Hassan has enemies. And when the Sultan asks these other men how much he should pay for Dosi, I note here the payment is somewhat assumed, these detractors suggested 50,000 dirhams in silver coins. And even this sum was too much. They say, given that Ferdowsi is a rafesi, a rejecter of Sunni values. So Mahmoud, Sunni that he is, follows the advice of the detractors and the poet receives only 20 dirhams. Insulted, Ferdowsi spends the sum on a bathman and a drink seller. Then fearing the wrath of the Sultan, he flees to Herat where he spends six months hiding in the house of Ismail Warak, father of the poet Arzaki. Then, when it is safe for him to travel, he takes his Shahnameh to Taberistan, to the court there of King Spahbad Shahriar. The king treats Ferdowsi kindly, and the poet composes a satire in a hundred verses against Mahmud, offering to dedicate his Shahnameh to Spahbad Shahriar, since um, the poet's Shahnameh glorifies the ancestors of this king. I note a contrast here with the King Mahmud as patron with the ancestry is in question with the satire. But Spahbad Shahriar was one of the vassals of Mahmud and appealing to the Shiite orientation of Ferdowsi, he advised him to follow the paths of the house of the prophet and to seek no worldly gains. The King offered a gift of 60,000 dirhams so the poet and, so the poet and uh, to the poet and persuaded him to destroy the satire. Ferdowsi went ahead and destroyed a hundred verses, so that now we only have six verses left. Now add a detail, almost as an afterthought. Ferdowsi was also persuaded to retain the original dedication to Mahmud. That was the additional advice of the vassal king. Further below, I will describe this maneuver as catch and kill. After that, Ferdowsi eventually goes back to Tus, where he spends the rest of his life in poverty and in fear of the Sultan. But meanwhile, Ahmadi Hassan is working on Mahmoud to forgive Ferdowsi and to reward him properly. One day, as Mahmoud is dictating a letter threatening an adversary, he asks Ahmadi Hassan for the right wording, who then quotes for the king a memorable passage from Ferdowsi. Now, Ahmadi Hassan guilt trips Mahmoud on how this poor poet had labored for 25 years and was left unrewarded. Finally, Mahmoud repents and sends to Ferdowsi 60,000 dinars in gold, plus an apology. But it's too late. The caravan that is bringing all the gold enters Tabaran via Gate Rudbar, while the corpse of Ferdowsi exits via the Gate Razan. A cleric in Taboran forbids burial in the cemetery, so Ferdosi is buried in his own orchard inside the gate. His tomb is still there, make, um, and Aruzi makes a pilgrimage to it many times. They say that Ferdosi left a daughter who refused the gift. The amount was spent on a rebat, a hostelry, on the road between Marv and Nishapur. In the source, which I, um, in this source, which is a lengthy narrative of Nezami Aruzi that I've just now finished epitomizing here, I find a stunningly interesting point of comparison with such an event that is still with us today. I indulge myself here by making a comparison. As we see in the version of the story told by Nezami, um, Nezami Aruzi, Fedosi reacts to being rejected by Mahmud, king of kings, by seeking the patronage of another king. This alternative patron is well disposed toward Ferdowsi, but fears retaliation from Mahmud, since this particular king is a mere vassal of the king of kings. I should quickly note here in passing that Mahmud and the vassal king were not really contemporaries at all in terms of history. 
who cares? In, in um, any case, the terms of the story that this alternative patron persuades Ferdowsi to destroy most of his verses that blame Mahmoud. In return for his destroying these verses, Ferdowsi now receives a reward from this alternative patron. Such a reward I find is comparable to a ploy known today in the world of tabloid journalism as catch and kill. The owner of a given tabloid, pretending that he wants to publish an incriminating story about a very important person, proceeds to buy the story from the seller of the story, but the real purpose of the publisher is not to publish the incriminating story at all, but rather to keep the story from ever getting published and um, thus protecting the very important person. I have drawn attention to this point of comparison because it brings home to us the sheer liveliness of lives of poet stories. For me, at least, these stories are at times just as engaging as the poetry they elucidate. And for those who are newcomers to say the poetry of Ferdowsi, I think that the experience of reading the translations of the lives of Ferdowsi, especially the life we find in the Baisangori preface, would enhance the experience of reading the Shachname itself, which I view as the jewel of world literature. With these thoughts in mind, I close this essay by here, a sample taken from the satire is quoted in the Baisangori preface. This sample gives an idea of the poetic power that drives the satire, which is a poem that one observer has described perhaps as the most terrific denunciation of an individual in the history of literature. I'm just going to do my translation. So if a, if a king who possesses the world had not been so tight-fisted, tang dust, my place would have been in a seat of dignity. There has never been anyone like Ferdowsi. What is cruel is that his face is no longer to be youthful. Such a king and such a potential benefactor, a most splendid one among the kings of the world, did not delve deeply into the book. His inequity was galvanized by the calumny of backstabbers. I labored hard in these past 30 years, bringing to life what is incomprehensible through the Persian language so pure. And that's it. Um, I don't know what to do, what, what, the, what the protocol now is. Do people just ask questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Holly. Yeah, that will be the protocol. So first of all, thank you. Thank you for this, this amazing talk. And uh, yeah, I, I regretted you didn't say more about yourself, but uh, a lot of you came through your talk as well. So that so was that, the idea. That's great. that's great. And uh, yeah, just as I thought, I'm I'm kind of always uh, perplexed by by the simplicity how how some readers uh, think. Of of texts and and assume that they they that every writer writes what they think, and this is just ridiculous. Even even us in Western academia, we don't write what we think. Uh, the majority of the world today doesn't say what they think. They at least one layer of double language is used uh, in 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 most most part of the world. So expecting that that that. Uh, uh, that when you are writing for a tyrant, you you necessarily uh, agree with your own words. It's just it's just uh, ridiculous, and especially then accusing someone of being un insincere. That, that's such a complete misunderstanding of, of not just history, but even of the present world. I I, I cannot cope with. But okay, so so I, I and yes, of course, uh, Gregory Nagy. And myself, we had the joy of living in communist Hungary for a, a while, so we we know we know that all too well. But yeah, so well, he left when he was six. So. <laughs> yeah, but st yeah, quite, even yeah. even the six year, six years, and, and he had he, he, he had, had his repression in the Catholic schools. Yes, okay, that's good. That's <laughs> also nuns, good. Scary nuns. So before I close uh, the the. The recording and and uh, open the floor for um, for questions. I'm trying. Oh, I to... would like to say one thing. All of this Please. is actually uh, available online. If you go to something called classic, um, 
oh wait a minute god i can't believe i forgot the name it's going to get uh critical inquiries it used to be critical inquiries and now it's i'm sorry i'm being really stupid i have to go and look at it um uh can't import this one right hang on i'm gonna have this uh make you guys smaller so i can go and do what i always do okay view small um exit full screen give me a moment <laughs> because i'm being really really okay. stupid meanwhile um, meanwhile i'm yep. i i'm adver advertising the next match list which will be immensely interesting on on adab <laughs> so not 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 far at all from today's talk and it's it's a huge uh, volume uh, edited uh, uh, by by uh, three uh, uh, colleagues Francesca Bellino Catherine Major uh, Major Jean, Jean, Jean uh, uh, and and uh, Luca Patrizzi so only only Francesca and Luca can can come and they will they will talk about this this uh, incredible uh, volume that that they edited for 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 years. Uh, yes. So yeah, please. Now please, I can tell yeah. you. Sorry, yeah. it's on classical continuum. Classical. So if you Google classical continuum, mm -hmm. um, this is what I've just said is up uh, up and writing, so you can see the uh, the poetry and everything, the actual Persian lines of the satire. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. So I'm I'm stopping the recording and open the floor for for questions.